Hey everyone, in this video I want to talk to you about a photo that I took, actually a series of photos on a recent trip to New York. I want to give you a little bit of a background as to kind of how I got the shot and then we're going to go over to the computer and I'm going to show you how I edit it because there was just a little bit of a problem that you'll see um, just kind of bugged me. Probably could have gotten away with it but I want to show you how I edited it in Adobe Lightroom and Photoshop. So. I was just in New York City recently visiting my family and also uh, I wanted to attend the Photo Plus Expo at the Javits Center. And you know, there's only so many hours you could spend roaming around the expo floor and having meetings. So one afternoon I got together with my wife Nicole and our friend Karen Hutton who is an amazing photographer and a Fuji X photographer and we just wanted to stroll around. And so we ended up at Washington Square Park, which if you've never been, I highly recommend it because it is an ideal place to photograph people. Not just photograph them, just to watch them. It's just so many different types of people. So uh, when we got there, one of the first things I noticed was there was there were these two bicyclists. One was riding and he had a GoPro and the other one was on his back wheel, just riding almost like a unicycle, just nonstop. He kept going around this little fountain and so, I had my camera with me and this was the setup that I had here. So this is the Sony A9 camera with the Zeiss Loxia 35mm f2 prime lens and it's a manual focus lens. Now for street photography, I, I 35mm to me is amazing. There's just some quality about that focal length and the compositions you get that I really love. Now one of the things that I like to do when I kind of hit a creative block with street photography is panning. I do panning a lot with cars. I do whenever I travel. It's just one of those things where I find that depicting motion in a still photo adds a really nice quality. So what I typically do in this case with this bicyclist is I had my camera set usually when I'm panning between 1 20th, 1 30th, even 1 10th of a second and then I adjust my aperture. To, for the appropriate exposure and then I just rifle off brackets and I'm moving along with the motion. So if it's a taxi cab or in this case it was the bicyclist going across the frame, I'm trying to move at the same rate, at the same speed as the bicyclist so that the bicyclist is sharp, everything else kind of goes blurry in this kind of directional blur. Now here's the thing with panning photography, at least in my experience, is that you're going to get a lot of misfires. You're just not going to be moving at the same rate or the position of your subject is going to be slightly off. Uh, and so there's a lot of experimentation, a lot of practice that goes into it. And sometimes it's just luck. You just happen to get that right shot, which is why I was using the Sony A9 camera specifically here. The Sony A9 can blast through like 20 frames per second. So I can keep photographing with the subject without ever worrying about the camera buffer filling up. So that's specifically, this camera is an intent based camera. If you're photographing anything where you need to photograph a lot of frames or there's something that's moving very quickly or very fast, this camera is really nice. And again, the Loxia 35 millimeter for me, as far as street photography goes, is an ideal choice. Now after about two or three laps around that little fountain in the foreground, the bicyclist went off and I started to chimp my shots. I wanted to see, review whether I got any keepers. And fortunately I did. You know, I got a bunch where, you know, they were just slightly off or the exposure was off or maybe my focus was off or the bicyclist just wasn't sharp. But there was this one photo in particular that I really like. And the only problem is when we jump over the computer, if you look at the bottom of the frame, you'll see what I mean. Uh, I just kind of messed up the composition just a little bit, but fortunately, it's not too hard to fix that in Photoshop. So what I want to do right now is jump over to the computer. We're starting in Adobe Lightroom Classic CC and we're also going to be using Adobe Photoshop 2018. And so we're going to use that software to start correcting the photos, stylizing it and just kind of get it at a really good place. So let's check it out. Here we are in Lightroom Classic CC and you can see this is the grid view of the photos. This is kind of the series of photos that I took of that bicyclist. And you can see as I pan across you can kind of get the idea of how I was panning or I was trying to pan with the bicyclist. So ultimately I settled between two different photos. I'm going to put them in the compare view. It's these two right here. And I'm going with the one on the left because you can see more of his face. It's a little bit sharper. Just the, the image itself is overall just a little bit sharper and the composition I, I just like better. So with this photo here, the problem that I have, and I mentioned this just a few minutes ago is that 
I just couldn't frame him properly because everything was moving so quickly. And you can see that the bottom of his rear tire is cut off at the bottom of the frame. And that to me, that's just something that always bothers me with uh, compositions, at least when I take them, is I want to make sure that something like this isn't just being cut off. It, there's something, it's like cutting off at a wrist or an ankle when you do a portrait. So I'm going to use Photoshop. We're going to start first by correcting the photo, just some basic corrections. Then we're going to go into Photoshop and I'm going to show you how I uh, manipulated the photo to kind of bring back that bottom part of the tire. So let's start out. I'm going to go by going into the develop module and I'm going to do a few quick things. Uh, first, I'm going to get a my correct white balance. So I'm going to take the color dropper here from the basic panel. This is going to allow me to sample a white or gray uh, to get a custom or correct white balance. So I'm just going to go right here off of his shirt. And you can see that it warmed the image up a bit, which is fine. Now I'm going to go down all the way to the bottom here to lens correction. I'm going to turn on enable profile correction, and that's going to apply a lens correction for the Loxia 35 millimeter F2 that I used to take this photo. And the last thing I want to do is just crop in a little bit, mostly so that I can get rid of this dark spot right here. I don't know about you, but those kinds of things always distract me. My eye just goes to it. So I'm going to go to the crop tool here. You can also do that by pressing R on your keyboard. And I always make sure that my uh, proportions are locked. So you can see here, normally I think by default, the lock is unlocked. So here I'm gonna go to lock, and then I'm gonna drag from the top left in just until we get rid of that. Cool. So you might have noticed I'm not doing any stylization just yet, I'm doing correction. So I got my custom white balance, we applied a lens correction profile and I adjusted the composition to remove that little distraction on the left. Now it's time to go in Photoshop and I wanna show you how I used it to kind of fake the bottom tire over here. It works kind of well. So to do that, let's go to photo, then let's go to edit in and we'll select Adobe Photoshop CC 2018. All right, so one of the first things I like to do in Photoshop is double click on the background layer. You can see it's locked. If you double click it and then click OK, it creates just its own layer, it's unlocked, so you can edit it and do anything as you would with a normal layer. And so remember, the point of this is I want to somehow bring the bottom part of this tire into frame, which means that I need to add some space below it. Now, the easiest way to do that is to adjust the canvas size. So if you go to Image and then Canvas Size, here is the actual resolution, the dimensions of the photo. Now. I can go ahead and add, say, like 200 pixels. So let's just go with, you know, 4,100 pixels. Now watch what happens here. If I zoom out, you can see that it adds some pixels at the top and the bottom. But I don't want that. I only want to add space below the bottom of the frame. I don't want to add anything on top. So let me undo that. We'll go back to Image, Canvas Size. Now, there's this anchor section right here. And this is really important because what this does is you can tell Photoshop where to add the extra space. So I want it at the bottom here. So to do that, I'm just gonna click on this up arrow and you can see that this tells Photoshop to only add the extra space at the bottom of the frame. And so now I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna change the height to 4100 and then click OK. And you can see now that all the space is just at the bottom here. There's nothing at the top. So the first thing I wanna do is take care of filling in pretty much all of this transparent area. To do that, I'm gonna start by creating a new layer. And the important thing here is we're gonna use a clone stamp because this whole entire area in the foreground fortunately is evenly toned and it's kind of out of focus. So it's not gonna be a problem in terms of blending it. So the clone stamp tool is ideal. So I'm gonna select that. And here's what's important. You wanna make sure that you have the all layers selected here for the sample. Otherwise, if you have it on current layer, for example, it's only going to sample transparency. So here, let's go ahead to all layers and I'm going to press the option or alt key to select a source. So something over here and let's make a nice big brush size and you can see the preview of the brush and now we can start closing in that extra space. All right, now you can see we've done a kind of a rough job of filling in the bottom of that extra space. And it looks pretty convincing just at face value. If we just look at it really quickly, it looks pretty convincing. So now it's time to fill in the bottom part of this tire, which still kind of looks flat um, from the bottom of the frame, of the original frame. So here's what we're gonna do. First thing is I wanna create what's called a stamped layer. And to do that, we're gonna use a really fun shortcut. It's called Command Shift Option E. And what that does is it takes all visible layers 
and it creates a new layer without actually merging them. And so in our layers panel, you can see here, we now have this new layer that has pretty much everything that we just did. Now it's time to actually fill in the bottom of the tire. To do that, let's create a duplicate layer of this new merged layer. We'll do that by pressing Command or Control J. There we go, that's our layer copy. And now I'm gonna to go to Edit and then Free Transform because what I wanna do is rotate this image. So check this out. Let's take the opacity of this layer, let's bring it down to about 50%, and then let's start rotating. And you can see now both layers. And what I'm doing is kind of get what I'm trying to do right now is I'm finding some of this tire here that will fit and it will look like the bottom of the tire. Now, another way to visualize this is let's bring that opacity to 100% and change the blending mode from normal to difference. What this does is it shows you exactly what it sounds like, the difference between two different layers. So the difference between the active layer and the layer below it. Anything that's similar will be dark. And you can see that for the most part, the background looks kind of the same, so it looks dark. But anywhere there are major differences, you'll see it in white and yellow and blue. It looks very psychedelic, kind of like an X-ray or a negative film. But the only area I care about right now is right over here at the bottom of this tire. And you can see that we're getting kind of that flat, round bottom here, which is exactly what I'm going for. And because we duplicated the layer, I can always readjust the position and, and retransform it if I want to. So let's stick with this for now. I'm going to click on the check mark to commit the transform. Let's change the blending mode back to normal. And now you can see we have this really funky image. And that's because obviously one layer is on top of the other. So what we want to do is add a layer mask, which is by default set to white, which is displaying everything. So let's press shift delete and fill it in with black. Now we can start masking back in the bottom of the tire. So to do that, let's select our brush, make sure that we're set to white as our foreground. And let's just see what we start to get here. That's not too bad. I mean, I'm, all I'm doing is I'm single clicking here. And for the most part, it's looking really good, right? I mean, we kind of filled it in. Now let's go, we'll go with the move tool and we'll just arrow over a little bit until all I'm doing is I'm aligning this tire. You might notice that there's, it's a little darker here and brighter here. I'm not worried about that. I'm not gonna take care of that right now because we can fix that in post. There are some areas here that I wanna fix up right now. So all I'm gonna do again is go back to transform by going to the edit menu and then selecting free transform. And I'm just going to use my arrow cursor right there to fine tune that inner wheel, that inner white rim. With that, let's click on the check mark to commit it. And now we're gonna go back into Lightroom to start stylizing. All right, so here we are in Lightroom. Let's go ahead and add a local adjustment brush. I'm gonna bring that exposure down just a bit. And what I wanna do is even out the tire. All right, now let's go back to the photo. And I'm gonna start with the tone curve. Now you might have your tone curve with these four sliders here, and that's pretty much the default value. I prefer to interact directly with it. So to do that, just click on this little button right here. Now I can interact directly with the tone curve. So what I'm gonna do is apply what we consider a typical S curve. I'm gonna bring up this area of the lights, bring down this part of the darks, and you can kind of see it looks a little bit like an S curve. And what I want to do to get that vintage look is I want to open up the shadows. I want to kind of make them a little bit muddier. To do that, just click on this left point, which is the shadows or the black point, and let's bring that up. And you can see here, especially in this area where it's darker, it gets kind of fuzzy. Now let's go back here to the basic panel. Let's drop that exposure just a bit. Bring the highlights down. Open up the contrast. And now I'm gonna add a little bit of clarity and a little bit of vibrance. So you can see what I'm talking about with that kind of vintagey slash contrasty look. But for the most part, it's a bit too warm. So here's what I'm gonna do now. I'm gonna to go to the split toning, which is probably my favorite part of Lightroom. And I'm gonna to go to the shadows and bring that hue over to around the blue area. Now you might be wondering, well, how do you know what the effect is? Well. If you press and hold the Option key on a Mac or the Alt key on Windows, as you drag around, it's gonna show you a preview of what each color hue looks like at 100% saturation. So I'm gonna to get to like right around here, and then I'm gonna start bringing that saturation out. You can do the same with the highlights. So if we wanna add a specific hue to the highlights, let's say I wanna add a little bit of an orange hue, I can do that. 
So let's just add a little bit of that. So this is what we call split toning. You're applying a specific hue or color value to the highlights and to the shadows independently. Now, the more that I look at his shorts, I'm not too happy with that. Shadows are a bit too kind of soft. So I'm gonna take the tone curve back down. And you can see here now we kind of equalize that. Now let's wrap up the image. So what I mean by that is let's start getting some sharpening dialed in. Now this is how I work with sharpening. First, I'm gonna take the target tool here and I'm gonna put it over somewhere that I think is relatively sharp. So like his cap over here or even his eye. Then I'm gonna to go to the amount slider. And again, I'm gonna press and hold the option key or alt key on windows and I'm gonna start dragging. And you'll notice that it turns the image grayscale. And that's important because it's easy to see the effects of sharpening on a grayscale or black and white image over a color one. And so I'm bringing it out until I start to see that kind of those details snap and somewhere right around there is looking really good. But I don't want sharpening applied to areas that are kind of lacking detail, so specifically the background. There's not much detail there, so that's why there's a masking slider. And just like before, I'm gonna press and hold the Option key or Alt key, and I'm gonna start dragging out. And what this is showing you is a mask of where sharpening is gonna be applied, which is the white areas, and where it's going to be masked out, which are the black areas. And then the last thing I'm gonna do is go back to the white balance and actually I'm gonna cool it off just a bit. And so now if we look at the image before, this is what we came back into Photoshop with. Then after, again, you can see that kind of, like I said, vintage contrasty look. All right, I hope you enjoyed this video. Hope you got some new ideas out of it and gives you kind of an idea of how you can salvage or fix a photo even if you can't get it right in camera the first time. Hit the thumbs up if you liked this video and the subscribe button if you loved it. And if you want to download this photo to kind of go along with the video on your own time, just click on the blog post link in the description below. Thanks a lot, guys, and I will see you next time.